a lot, Sebastian, for <laughs> such for the invitation. You know, I hear a lot of very nice story about this, uh, this cost action. I'm very glad to finally be present in one of the meeting. Um, I also wish to uh, thank the Trinity College for hosting this event. You know, really honored to to give a speech in this uh, ancient and so honored institution. So today I prepare a, a presentation about my recent and, uh, and, uh, and not so recent work about the value information that I hope that is kind of relevant for this idea of quantifying what's the benefit of, um, of monitoring uh, infrastructure components. Uh, first of all, we have acknowledgments. Uh, basically, most of what I show today is the work of two great PhD students, Milad graduate maybe a bit, been more than one year ago, and Carl graduate very recently, and then uh, Shaolin, his picture is smaller because it's just a master student, but who knows, maybe it will grow. And then uh, the financial support of some uh, agency in the US, National Science Foundation, and um, um, PETA, is uh, an agency that uh, try to facilitate uh, um, collaboration with industry and then there are some uh, initiatives for smart cities and for the energy sector inside Carnegie Mellon University that is this institution that I, that I work uh, in, in in Pittsburgh Pennsylvania so the basic motivation of, of my research is uh, related to the state of, uh, of uh, the bad state some sense of uh, infrastructure system in the US this is the very famous uh, uh, card uh, provided by the American Society of Civil Engineers that essentially claim that uh, uh, huge investments are needed to upgrade the state of many kind of infrastructure system. Uh, roads that we need about 200 billion investment. Uh, bridges, uh, there the problem is mainly related to to their age, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the assets become older and older because like a replacement. And then same story goes also for the, for the energy system. And there are a lot of possible line of research that can be addressed, these issues, uh, but specifically me and also, of course, uh, this large community of, you know, also structural health monitoring, uh, try to uh, use data and technology to um, optimize the use of resources for improving the state of these infrastructure components. For example, now, uh, kind of buzzwords is that of uh, cyber physical system, the idea of integrating computation and sensing into the, the physical assets to, to, to improve their uh, the, the management. For example, this is a company in, um, in Pittsburgh that uh, they use uh, these pigs, this pipe uh, inspection and gauges to see what is the condition of, uh, of uh, sewer pipes. And there is some activities going on in the university about using um, main uh, aerial vehicles to, to inspect bridges. So uh, the core of, uh, of my approach to that is, uh, is uh, this concept of value information that I think here in this, this community, the, you know very well, just a small recap, what it is the idea that you, uh, you're dealing, uh, you have a decision-making problem, you're dealing with some part of the world, you know, this app indicates this part of the world you're dealing with that, maybe you don't know what it is, you, know, you don't know what is the state, suppose, of an infrastructure component, uh, but you can observe maybe indirectly with some, uh, some uh, noise and uh, imprecise way, you can get some information about the state. And then given this information, you have, after that you have to take a decision about suppose, the maintenance of this component. And then you have to pay a loss, a cost, suppose, that is a uh, function both of the action that you take and the hidden uh, state of the, of the, of the work. So uh, to, to, to solve this kind of problem of decision making under uncertainty, first of all, you have to treat, to process the information, and this is what uh, uh, Bayesian inference allows you to do, the idea that uh, uh, given this, this uh, observed why you compute maybe what is the posterior probability of the state of the world given the observation. And then uh, you can also find out what for any given action what is going to be the expected loss. You can uh, optimize your action given this, uh, this uh, kind of noisy posterior state of mind in which you have still some uncertainty about, uh, about uh, the, um, uh, the condition. And then if you marginalize on all the possible scenarios about what, what kind of information this sensor, suppose a sensor network can give you, then you realize what would be the expected cost uh, having this possibility of managing this infrastructure component 
with the sensor. And when you compare that with a higher expected cost, not having the sensor, so you know, having to take a decision under this higher uncertainty about what is the state of infrastructure, when you compare that, you can define this value information as the difference of this, again, this supposedly high co expected cost without a sensor and the lowest one with a sensor. And it's guaranteed to be, under some condition, it's guaranteed to be to be on a negative, but I will say this uh, something a bit more in the in the, the later in the in the end of my talk if I have time. So this is already computationally is already a challenging quantity to assess because for first you know consider uh, you know that you are cons uh, that you are designing maybe a sensing system, a network made by different sensors. First of all, you have to ask yourself what kind of uh, measures this sensor should should give me. Then how I uh, how shall I react? to this measure, how can I process this information, what will be the, 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 um, the optimal action, and if, you, and if you integrate on all this possible information that you can get, that you can get the value of information. So, but then if uh, you are in the stage of designing what is the optimal configuration of your sensor, you have essentially to repeat this, uh, this exploration again and again. You see, well, what if I what if remove one sensor? What if I add another sensor, right? What would be the additional value in doing that? And if you're able to compute the value for you know, alternative, for example, configuration of sensor system, you can figure out what would be the optimal way of exploring. Uh, so it's very challenging, but if you're able to do that, of course, the benefit is pretty high. For example, you can, uh, by the value information, kind of uh, tells you what is the maximum uh, um, amount of money, maybe, right, that you should be uh, willing to pay for getting this information, because if you pay more, the overall gain would be negative. You should not pay an infinite amount of money. You should not overpay for information, let's say. Uh, on the other hand, you can also compare kind of uh, explorative and exploitative action that maybe this is a terminology of computer science, but essentially means that there are actions like repairing a bridge, there are actions like installing a sensor, there are different costs, and in, uh, in the asset management uh, uh, setting, you have to figure out if it is better to invest in sensor or in, uh, in, uh, in exploitative or sorry, passive action in some sense. And then, you know, again, you can use this metric for ranking alternative exploratory action. For example, it's better to monitor in this component or this other component or inside this component. It's better to, to use uh, this kind of sensor or this other. You know, again, you can rank them in terms of value information and figure out what is the optimal, well, what is the optimal way to do. So, <coughs> uh, personally, I, I work, uh, I've used this concept for using, uh, in terms of specially distributed system, for example, uh, a network of, of bridging under seismic risk, or I think I will have also a slide about temperature fields, and with uh, uh, and using temporal models, in which essentially the problem is more complicated because you have to take a sequence of, of action one after the other, and you have somehow to predict maybe what is the future relevance of collecting a piece of information right now. Just you know, a brief. I, I will not cover much about a special distributed system, but this is an idea. We, we have now a project about uh, uh, Urbat, uh, the so-called Urbat Heat Island effect, the effect of temperature on, on the city. And the idea is that uh, uh, we have to combine this uh, uncertain information that we have at the distribution of the temperature and uh, and some risk effect that the high temperature have to 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 people. And so uh, we. We, we have calibrated some model, some probabilistic model about uh, how temperature will evolve in time in collaboration with, with Princeton. And then, you know, in terms, we, we, we are recommending the placement of some sensor that in this case are, are water, sorry, our weather station in the city of Pittsburgh. And I think, you know, think maybe the, the only kind of really relevant thing here is to see this kind of classical graph of how the value information goes when you place more and more sensor. You know, if you place just one sensor, you have a high benefit. <coughs> And then you, if you go on placing more and more sensor, of course, you know, uh, if there's no cost in doing that, you have a, a monotonically increasing function because the more information you have, the better, but you have this kind of diminishing low curve in, according to which you start having more and more redundant information because if the temperature field supposes it's rather smooth, if you place uh, many, many thermometers, then you start receiving again this kind of redundant information, this is why kind of the derivative is going down. And so if you include a cost for adding, maybe a linear cost for adding more and more thermometers, you see that basically there is a peak and then goes down depending on, so you know, if the cost of thermometer maybe is this one, maybe the optimal number of thermometers is nine. If the thermometers are, are more expensive, you know, then the optimal number is four. 
Okay, but this is just you know so this is just to uh, again uh, 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 this, this this final work of the student Carl is is about the idea that uh, uh, suppose you have a um, uh, uh, physical phenomenon that changes but suppose contamination this can represent maybe contamination or again a temperature field that change in time and this is you know just a realization of what can happen you know this uh, this is the field changing in space and time and then when you see when the field uh, goes above a specific threshold when this surface goes above this threshold you see this area thing that is is, uh, is contaminated or is a dangerous area and given that the question is of course you can't in reality observe the entire field because you have to put sensor for observing that so the question would be uh, uh, how can you um, locate the sensor and move it uh, adaptively depending on what is your current observation uh, about, uh, about this field. So in this simulation essentially you see uh, by, by processing the current information that we have about that we place the sensor and then this is uh, our kind of uh, the, our decision some sense this, uh, uh, mitiga about mitigating this area and this is the true optimal uh, kind of the true correct area to be mitigated and so essentially maybe it's not, not so easy to to follow this, but essentially it's interesting to notice but it's fine, that the value information generally is high when you don't know what to do. It's not high when the field is high or when the field is low. It's really high when you are uh, more or less above the threshold because in this case you don't really know what to do, right? You, the question is should I expand my mit mitigation area or not? So this is, you know, just show how generally in this problem of sensor placement and scheduling, you know, what are the features that make value information high is because maybe you, 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 if you have high uncertainty, there's good benefit in, in, in measuring that. Uh, but you, you know, also if, if the field is high generally, you, know, you, you, you may think that there is a high, high benefit and then maybe you, know, you have the idea that when you measure one point, you learn a lot. If the field is moved, you learn about a, a wide area. That is the case. Again, it's another feature that makes the value high. And then, you know, in temporal process, it's a bit more complicated because, you know, you can think that it's worth taking a measure now for knowing something nice about what happened in the future. So this is maybe I, this is uh, one, one more piece of work. But now I, I want to, you know, talk maybe about mo something more related to it, really the idea of also of uh, monitoring uh, structural and, and infrastructural components. So just to give an idea for so in, in, uh, to, to, to my general landscape is that this value, this concept that, uh, again, this community may already knows very well, has been developed starting from uh, probably from the 60s. I think there's some controversy that the Russian got it first, but I'm not really an expert of that. But uh, my r key reference for that is uh, Howard Reifa and, and Ron Howard in the 60s. And, uh, and then, of course, there's been, uh, uh, in the last decades, a lot of work on that. In our, uh, in our community, I think, I'm, again, I'm not afraid of all the, all, the, um, all the reference, but I think uh, Michael Faber uh, started working on that, but Daniel, also in his PhD thesis, is working on that. Uh, I started working with that with Daniele and uh, Daniele Zonta, and then with Armen, and then Sebastian and James. You know, these are, probably, you know, uh, among uh, the, probably the most active uh, researchers in this area for, for civil engineering and generally infrastructure systems. So, uh, uh, you know, for what I'm presenting now, I'm going to give you the basic, uh, the basic uh, probably simplest possible problem that one can face uh, in, in infrastructure management, the idea that you have a system that has a binary state, can be failure or, or damage, you know, just you know, it's a binary variable that define kind of the state of this component. And then you have, can take a binary action that is do nothing or repair. And the question is, what shall you do? Should you repair or do nothing? And then there is a loss function, a loss matrix, very simple, that say, essentially, if the infrastructure is undamaged, uh, well, if you do nothing, you pay nothing. That's very nice. But uh, if you uh, do nothing and the, and the infrastructure component is damaged, you're going to pay the, the cost of failure, but it potentially is very high. But as, as an alternative, you can repair this component and if you do that, just with, by paying the, the, cost, the, the cost for, for, for repairing, the generally is much less than the cost of failure. You, you essentially eliminate the risk of failure. So if that is the case, the question, what shall you do? And this is a graph depending on the probability of failure, right? Essentially, what you know about this binary component is summarizing by in just one number, ranging from zero to one, that tells you what is the probability that the component is gonna fail. 
And if you decide to repair, you know, the cost you're gonna pay is flat. In this case, it was, I don't know, $4,000. You know, no matter what is your belief, because you see basically that uh, no matter if the component is um, damaged or not, you know, this is what you're gonna pay. But if you more uh, aggressive, in sense, if you do nothing, of course, you have to face a risk that grows linearly for zero. If your probability of failure is zero, you're absolutely sure that component is fine, and so you're doing nothing, you're going to pay nothing. On the other hand, if this is one, you're absolutely sure the component is gonna fail, and you're going to pay the cost of failure. And in between, the expected cost is just linear, of course, right? Just probability of failure multiplied by the cost of failure. So this is the, the, the minimum cost that is related to an optimal policy that is essentially doing nothing until you know, it's too risky. And it's too risky, in this case, just probability of failure, this, this, uh, this threshold is just the ratio between the cost of failure and the cost of repair. Uh -huh. So you do nothing up to here, but if you find yourself believing that probability of failure is too high, you do, do, you do repair. This is the pretty obvious optimal uh, policy. Now, if you can observe the state of this variable before you take a decision, now it's much better because uh, suppose that if, if information is perfect, uh, you can uh, uh, implement this very simple policy that is, if you observe it is, if it is undamaged, do nothing, and if, if you observe it and it's gonna fail, repair, okay? And in this case, the cost you're gonna pay essentially is linearly between zero and the cost of repair. Why? Because essentially failure goes completely out of the window, the, the component will never fail because you can you can always eliminate the failure. Uh, essentially, you're going just to repair and pay the cost of repair if the component is going to fail. And so, you know, the, the risk is really the product of probability, or, so probability of failure and cost of repair. So you see, basically, this, is, uh, this expected cost is always less than the higher expected cost that the guy without information is going to pay. And the difference between the two is the value information. In this case, would be expected value of perfect information. But essentially here, is just, uh, well, it's also, of course, also a function of other, other factors, but here I just plot it in terms of uh, probability of failure. So, of course, it's zero. There's nothing to learn if you know already that the component is perfect. If there's nothing to learn, if you know that it's gonna fail. If there is uncertainty, there is some value knowing before you go on a decision. And specifically, the maximum value is not uh, when, uh, you know, when, when the probability of failure is very, very high. It is essentially in the point in which essentially you don't know what to do, all right? This, uh, you know, key in this point, uh, these two actions has the same uh, expected cost, so you don't really know what to do, and there was this, this very high value in, in, uh, in learning what's going on. Uh, what if you have to take a lot of decision one after the other? Unfortunately, it's become much more complicated. You can think of, of, uh, of um, you know, of in time of uh, alternating, maybe action, observation, action, observation, and so on. Um, uh, unfortunately, this grows exponentially with the number of steps in the future that the kind of depth grows because, you know, uh, if you have to look at for 10 observation and any, uh, you have to, maybe 10 steps in the future, you have a lot of observation and action available in every step, you know, the number of leaves in the trees grows very, very fast. But if you are able to do that, that's perfect. This is exactly the optimal, uh, you know, you, you, you're able to figure out exactly what is the optimal strategy. So. Uh, this idea of using some Markov process is based on the idea that when you look at the tree, you may realize that uh, uh, in some different point in the tree, essentially, there's some sufficient statistics, there's some knowledge that is the same, okay? So maybe, I don't know, think of a simple case in which uh, uh, in this path, the, the, the component state can just range between one and five, and you can observe exactly one mean perfect, five mean horrible. Now, if you, you see what's going on after, I don't know, three years, well, if after three years I'm in state three, no matter how I arrive there, if I arrive from this path of a tree on that path of a tree, what are the optimal action uh, after you know, observing that the component is in state three after three years, suppose, is the same, okay? And so if you rely on this assumption that is getting ready to some Markovian principle, then hopefully you can think that uh, the complexity grows uh, much slower that in the, in, the, in the entire tree because essentially you have just to take care of, uh, of this um, possible belief that you may have in different, in different steps. So uh, this is uh, related with the use of a partially observable market decision process for solving this kind of problem that is something that um, you know, the student Bilad has done with me in the past. So the idea here is that uh, instead of facing again just one decision, you have to face a sequence of decision. You know, you have an infrastructural component and the state of infrastructural component change in time, 
right? This is this uh, hidden uh, chain is how, you know, uh, year by year, suppose the infrastructure component changes state and is affected by your actions. Every year, suppose you have to take an action like repair, do nothing, um, so on, and these affect the evolution. But you can't observe that directly. You can just observe this indirectly through, for example, for using some sensor. And then you have to pay a cost that is a function of your action and the hidden state. So just to give you an example, suppose there are three possible state and damage, damage and collapse. This is how the infrastructure component can be. There are three possible action, do nothing, inspect, repair. And four possible observation, but maybe noisy version of what the state is. And your goal is to minimize the expected discounted cost on this process, where you have to take an action right now and then a sequence of action with the idea of minimizing this expected discounted cost. Uh, well, this. Uh, so the key observation here is that there is a sufficient statistic that is called the belief. Uh, you know, it's not, it seems not really a technical term, but this is, you know, is used technically, as m most of you may know. And is essentially the, the, at any moment in time is the, uh, the probability, uh, the posterior probability of, uh, of the current state given all the observation that you have collected so far. So for example, in one moment in time, you can, may think that uh, uh, with 70% probability the, the state is undamaged, with 10% 10 10 probability is already collapsed, with 20% probability is damaged. So you see basically because there are three possible states, the belief is uh, pi with uh, three slices. And essentially, the idea is that your action, your current action, should be based on what you believe is. Uh, so, you know, this is, uh, again, uh, just a, uh, a representation of the possible belief. This is a cube with side one. So, you know, all the, all the uh, vector, like, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent are represented by points inside this cube. But among those vector, only those normalized to one are relevant because the belief has to be normalized to one. You know, the pie chart has to sum to one. And so this triangle represents all the possible beliefs, right? All the well-normalized belief. So if you look from above this triangle, this is how it looks like. You know, it is uh, essentially, if, you, if your belief is one third, one third, one third about this three possible state and damage, damage collapse, then you will be here. Uh, while if you are in the vertex, mean that you know with certainty, 100% probability, the component is undamaged, damaged, or collapsed. Uh, so, for example, this specific chart uh, is represented by this point. This is your, if this is what you think, you are here in this domain, okay? And then, essentially, what happens is that you are able to predict how you b your belief will change depending on the observation that you have. For example, under the, the action doing nothing, you can think that you can receive specific information that if you receive some bad symptoms, suppose this is how your belief will change with certain probability towards the, this is, you know, essentially certainty of collapse. And, uh, and um, if you receive some good symptom, maybe you update in this direction your belief towards some damage and so on. For example, if you repair, you can also think in the kind of Buddhistic sense that the fact of repairing is, well, first, okay, an effect on the physical infrastructure, but it's also effect on your belief, because if you repair, even if you don't expect, you, you think that the state would be much better because maybe repairing has a very good tradition of improving what the state is. And then maybe you can take a visual inspection, and if you take a visual inspection, you think maybe the belief will collapse to one of the corners. Okay, you know, you, you go there, you inspect, it may be expensive to do that, but as an effect, you know, uh, you will update uh, your belief towards uh, certainty to one of the state. And so given that, you know, the question is, okay, I, 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 I see how stochastically the belief evolves in time. What is the optimal policy? What shall I do, right, if I, if I specify the cost and so on? And for doing that, you have to solve the Bellman equation. Yep, so the Bellman equation. And this would be, for example, an example of an outcome of the Bellman equation that defines what, what the optimal policy is. The optimal policy is, depending on your belief, maybe you should do nothing, or only if you are here, very close to, you know, uh, the probability of damage or failure is pretty, pretty low, you are almost very confident that the, the, the component is undamaged. In that area, you do nothing. On the other hand, uh, if you have a significant high probability of uh, collapse of damage, you do repair, and in this, in between, you know, maybe you do a visual inspection under these specific circumstances. So this is the optimal policy. If you believe it, this is how you know you should, uh, you know, behave in in uh, acting with, you know, confronting with this component. So for example, you know, the optimal policy is optimal because it's guaranteed to give you this minimum cost. So think here, there is a surface, but depending on where you are in terms of belief. You know, I can tell you what is uh, the expected cost to go. Okay? So if you manage a component, started from this 
points and going on, you can figure out what the cost is. For example, along this line, just not to plot surfaces, so here along this line, this is how the cost goes. If you certainly to be undamaged, the cost is pretty low, $40,000. It's higher if there is some probability of, uh, of, uh, of damage, essentially. And now you can ask, what if I install better sensor? What would be the effect of installing better sensor on this, on this component? If you do that, essentially, you know, you have just to solve another PMDP, another partial observer micro decision process, another kind of independent problem, in which maybe the relation between the state and the observation is closer, right? Maybe the observation has a higher quality and consequently you, you, know, you just slightly change the problem. And if you do that, for example, you think that two things happen. First, you know, the policy is changing. Maybe you have not to do visual inspection anymore because now you have such good sensor that allows you to avoid visual inspection. And on the other hand, you can see uh, that the, the expected cost to go goes down. And you can think this is, you know, in this context, this would be the value information, right? The idea that if I install, you know, not just once, but you know, in a, um, for, for a very long uh, supposed management process, if I install better sensor, how is the cost influence? You see the cost goes down, you can measure what it is, and this is the value information. And then, you know, just to, I think, you know, well, maybe I skip that, it's very important. Uh, so, as a detail, importantly, this partial observer micro decision process may be a very a pretty, you know, complicated to solve depending on the context, but luckily there are effective uh, approaches and software that are able to do that. This is what developed in the University of Singapore a few years ago and is based on what is called a uh, point-based value iteration that is a nice approximate way for solving PMDPs. Uh, so how much time do you have? Okay, good. So, you know, I would just give you now two, I think, two, uh, two st still two more sections. One is a recent uh, uh, work <coughs> that uh, uh, Sean uh, has done and probably will be presented in IWSHM, so it's something pretty, pretty new, but it's just essentially a, a parametric analysis how the value information depends on specific context. To do that, we start with a very simple problem, again, a component that can be in free state, intact damage, and, and, and failure. And the idea that if you don't have the monitoring system, you don't see the damage, right? You, when it fails, you see it, all right? But uh, you can't distinguish intact and damage. Suppose, you know, the, the, the damage is inside the components. There's no way if you install the sensor that you can notice, right? But if it fails, that, of course, you notice. Uh, but then, you know, if this is few to nothing, you can pay some cost of repair. If you do that, no matter if it's damage or the, after the failure, you can go back to the intact state. So there is some, uh, you know, numbers, maybe uh, cost of failure, half a million dollar, cost of repair, uh, 10K, uh, and then you have some probability of, uh, of uh, deterioration, essentially. And what you would do without uh, the sensor, what can you can call an open loop policy, in which essentially, see, remember, you don't see the damage, so you have to, you know, rely on some prior model that tells you that randomly the damage will occur sooner or later, and you have to base your, your repair on that. Maybe it's something similar to what you do with the chain of your engine, something like that. Some miles better to repair because otherwise it's going to break. So this is what you do is intact then becomes damaged, you don't notice, but then you repair and then again, and maybe you, know, maybe you repair when it was, never, it was not even damaged because you, know, you don't know when you repair. And then sometimes the uh, uh, damage and failure is so quick that unfortunately it, uh, you know, it, uh, with certain probability it fails before you, 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 you have implemented your open loop periodic repair, I suppose, right? But if you got sensors, maybe you think that every now and then you, 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 you have some measure what the state is and damage or damage, now it's perfect, but you may, may, maybe, some, you, maybe sometimes the sensor also give you a wrong answer, you know, incorrect detection, but. Uh, and, and now you can base your decision about uh, what the sensor tells you, right? Maybe if you, if you receive good symptom, you postpone the repair. If you have bad symptom, this is here, see, good symptom, postpone the repair, bad symptom, you do repair. And now you're, you're able to see what is the cost in the over loop, what is the cost in the closed loop, you make the difference, this is the value information. And so we try to see, okay, how does this, uh, you know, when, when we make it the problem a bit more, more, more general, how does this is, is influenced by the, 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 the accuracy of the measure that we have, by how many measures do we collect, by the, the, the information that we have apart, you know, on top of the sensor, the repair cost and so on. So just give you some graph about that. This is uh, how the value information change depending on the viability of the sensor. Essentially, more or less, how frequently you inspect your component.
okay? How frequently you collect some information. And quite in, you know, intuitively, it's monotonically with that. The more information you collect, the higher is this value. Uh, again, as uh, for this concept uh, that I showed you before in the, when you collect uh, temperature measure in a city, you know, generally there is a high benefit uh, in the first measure and then it starts flattening down. If you collect more and more frequently, there's not really such a huge benefit in that. Um, okay. uh, right, you know, what if, for example, the same graph you see, what if, for example, you change the degradation? What if you uh, consider, I'm keeping all the other parameters the same, components that degrade faster, a component with the degrade slower, uh, yeah, generally, you know, the idea could be that if there is a component that degrades uh, faster, you know, there is higher value in inspecting that and there is higher value in inspecting it very, very frequently. While if a degradation is very, very slow, you know, you can think that even if you, you know, rarely inspect it, you know, you will able to, to catch the, 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 the damage before it's too late. So the idea that this curve, for example, is very flat tells you that right, there is some benefit in inspecting every 10 years, suppose every 10th step of this component, but then you know, if, you, if you inspect more frequently, there's not really much additional benefit because the, the process is so slow, but you should not go there any, any, any day and inspect what happened because you, know, you, know, you have time uh, when the damage uh, arrives to, to take an action before it's too late. Another you know, inaccuracy that tells you this is how bad are the sensor, what is the mismatch between the true state and the outcome of your sensor. So this would be a perfect measure, you know, if, if there is a damage, uh, if the inaccuracy is zero, the sensor tells you that there is a, a damage and vice versa, there's no damage, no false alarm. But then when you have inaccuracy, essentially you have uh, potentially uh, some misinformation and then uh, the value information kind of intuitively is monotonically decreasing in that. The, the worse are your sensor and, and, and the lower the value information is up to a certain point where the sensor are so, so bad, maybe even, uh, sorry, there, sorry. Uh, I mean independent with respect to the state of a component and this is the case, there's no value at all essentially. Um, okay, just this is, uh, uh, unpredictability, um, suppose you know the idea that even without the sensor there's a long tradition of developing models that tell you something about what would be the failure time for example. If I do nothing, how long does it make for my component to fail? This is the uncertainty of that, it is called unpredictability. And so the idea is that if this is very small, you're doing pretty well in them without the sensor because you can, the, the open loop policy works pretty well because you know, the bright colleagues in maybe in a, in a uh, solid mechanic and so on are able to predict how the deterioration will be even without sensor. That is the case value slow. If on the other hand, uh, the, the you have a, a high uncertainty about, uh, so essentially if you don't know what's going on without the sensor, there is why the value of the sensor is high. Um, this is, if you think, think it's mathematically important, it's not really true. See, it's not really true, always true, that uh, uh, uncertainty in prior information is monotonically with, with value information, but in this case it is. And then we, we investigate two more things. One is um, reaction time. You know, uh, in order for having some, some value, you should be able to, in, depending on the problem, in some limited time, gather the information and react and implement some policy. In, if you think maybe in some context you can't do that, right? You collect information, but then if you want to repair, it takes many months or years to repair. If you do that, of course the value information goes down because even if you have very precise, very good sensor, still the fact that you need so long for reacting may kind of some sense, you know, defeat the, the old purpose of the monitoring system, right, in some sense. And so here we show essentially, this is really mathematically proven, but of course, you know, if you have this constraint that when you say, okay, I want to repair, you have to wait TR, TR years, like five, seven, so on, then the value information is monotonically decreasing in that. And then just to, you know, this would be what, uh, you know, how does the value information change with the uh, repair cost? The idea is that if the repair cost is zero, there's no value because you always fair, it's so cheap if the, the repair cost is, uh, is, uh, is very, very high, you never repair, you just take the chance of dealing with, with a failure component. And so the value information, of course, is not monotonic in the cost of repair. There is uh, an, optimal, you know, an optimal setting when the cost of repair is so that essentially you don't, you don't really know what to do, more or less, again. This is where the value is high, but otherwise, essentially, it's, it's, you know, it's not true if, even in the, in the first branch, it's not true that the, the higher is the cost of repair and the most, you know, the most benefit is to collect information. 
And then this count factor essentially is a way of, of saying how long is your management process. Is the, your management process very, is very short, there's a short value. If uh, when this discount factor tends to be one, turns out to be equivalent to say that the monitoring uh, process is very long, and that is the case, the value information goes, goes up essentially. Uh, see, still maybe 10 minutes, is it? No, 10 minutes, maybe five, 10? Okay, maybe, okay, maybe let's, this is just another application given, you know, before it was the value of installing a monitoring system that is there forever. Then I had I done some research in terms of if you have many components and you have to send right now what component to inspect, uh, you know, how can you decide what component to inspect? And maybe I will skip that, but the, the basic idea is something like this, you know, you can track what is the current value of information of inspecting each of the component, and then somehow the component compete among themselves. You can say, if I'm monitoring the first component, I get some value, monitoring the second one, I get some number of value, and then when the value is high, same thing, you know, maybe you have a brand new component, value is low, and then you have uncertainty, the value goes up, and then in this kind of auction model, when one component wins, you inspect it, and then you know what is the state, the value goes down, and so on. So this is just kind of framework for uh, kind of adaptive scheduling of, of inspections about component. And then the last thing that I want to mention is this, uh, well, maybe I can skip this because I already mentioned it. Um, you know, is yes, uh, this, uh, that the ICOS are working with, with uh, I mean, in the same, uh, in the section uh, of Sebastian, we are, now investigating this problem that maybe kind of hope it, you know, maybe you're familiar with, this is, uh, that we may call information avoidance. The, the fact that sometimes people pretend, you know, prefer not to know, and there is some rationality behind that. Not always, but there could be. So the idea, just to give an example, is this one. Suppose that uh, you, you're following a building code, and the building code tells you that you have to repair when the probability of failure of the body is too high. Okay, there is a threshold here, and say, and the building code tells you the probability of failure is above whatever, you have to repair, even if you prefer not to because you're a very risky agent and you don't really care if it fails, maybe uh, morally it's very bad, but you can, you, can, you can have this different utility function and that is the case, you would prefer not to repair, but, uh, but, you, but, you, but you are forced to that. Um, so, if this is the case, you know, it turns out if you think about in this specific context in which the probability of failure is here, uh, maybe you, you find out uh, to re uh, repairing very convenient because you are obeying the, the rules of the building code and, uh, and you have to invest a lot of money in repairing your infrastructure component. But if you can inspect it, you can escape this uh, uh, for you, uh, you know, um, um, unfair constraint. However, there is, and it is in the opposite case of that, it's kind of interesting, Suppose that uh, you are here, maybe, you know, the, the current uh, uh, probability of failure is below the threshold. So according to, to the code, your building, suppose, is safe enough, okay? Suppose the probability of, you know, the threshold is 10 to the minus 3, and this is, I don't know, 0.5, 10 to the minus 3. So you are safe enough, right? So you're very happy and, until someone knocks on your door and want to install some sensor. And the question is, shall you install this sensor? No, the sensor is free, okay? There's no cost of that. And so according to this non-negativity of value information, you should say, yes, why not? But actually the reason, reason why not, because you say, okay, what if I receive bad news and the sensor tells me that the probability of failure is higher than my prior one? And in this case, you know, I have this negative effect that the probability of failure uh, make my component uh, be in this uh, under kind of uh, the, the, the constraint of the code. And, and essentially, as a consequence, I, I need to repair my component. Okay, so I can figure out that it's better for me not to, not to install the, the, the system if it is this free, and even if, you know, kind of paradoxical way, I'm, 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 if I compute value information is negative, meaning that I should be willing to pay this guy not to install the sensor. Okay, so we try to say what would happen, okay, and we have a very simple model of that. This is the same slide I showed you before, but with imperfect information, the value you see is, uh, is lower when you have imperfect information. And now in this specific setting in which the value information like this, this is essentially the same setting as before, uh, there is society, and society has a different cost matrix with respect to yours. For society, for some reason, the cost of failure is really, the failure is really, really, uh, you know, a, a bad event, much worse than it's for you. So the cost of failure for society, from, you know, as judged from the societal point of view, is much higher than yours. 
if that is the case, essentially what society does by using the building code is implementing a policy that is more restrictive than yours. You have your own policy. Your policy will be, you know, be pretty you know, aggressive, maybe up to this probability of failure. But because failure is so bad for society, society tells you, no, 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 you have to repair if you are above this threshold. You don't agree with that, but you have to, you have to obey. And then the question is, in this context, someone offers you a piece of information and, uh, and, um, and you have to accept or reject uh, this piece of information. Essentially, you have to compute what the value is. And well, first, sorry, this, this now, sorry, if you think about it, this is new, the new <laughs> optimal cost. You know, this is when you are free of the society rules, but this is when the society rules is, is active. So here you have the discontinuity right, of the, of the cost. But if you think about it, it's pretty significant and weird. Because before, even if, you know, even before you have to, to do two different actions, repair or do nothing, very different action. So it may be essentially that, you know, if you update your probability of failure, there is a point in which a very small perturbation takes you beyond the boundary, uh, the decision boundary, and you completely change your action. Instead of doing nothing and, uh, and stay in your office all day, you decide to repair the bridge. Very, very different action. But in terms of cost, you see the co expected cost is continuous. Okay? And for example, a consequence of that, that if the information is so, is so noisy that it moves you really of a small quantity in, this, uh, in terms of probability of failure, the value is very small. But here it's very different because here society uh, put a constraint, suppose a 10 to the minus three, and if you are just, just a bit below or just a bit above, you make a huge difference, right? You have this finite huge gap when you cross that. And because of that, the value information kind of becomes more complicated and really can become negative. It means that you can really, you know, you can, there's really people that prefer not to know, even rationally prefer, you know, but this is essentially just one of the explanations. There are many reasons why people may prefer not to know, but um, so in this context is really the idea that uh, uh, the, the, the observation takes you to the risk of being, you know, under the, the control of society and you prefer to do that because, because you're a greedy anarchist essentially. And, uh, and right, so, and at, at the moment, we are, we are um, analyzing this problem and, you know, in terms of public policy, the question would be how can society try to alleviate this problem? You know, because if a building code tells you you have to repair above a certain threshold, that of course is very good for preventing people to be too risky with, uh, with their own asset, but has this, uh, this negative consequence about about uh, you know sub uh, suboptimality in information, maybe, you know for example, will people in cer certain specific uh, circumstances will try to avoid collect information. Um, so the question is, we're trying out so how to solve that. If you think about it, maybe you know you have also better ideas of that I do. One would be uh, you know. To, to force the, require the collection of information inside the code, of course, there are some examples of that. It seems to me a bit complicated because you know, the perfect way would be that essentially, so agents now are not even free to collect information. So the building codes uh, tell, follow this formula that uh, gives you what is called the value information. If this is above, uh, uh, above the custom information, you are forced to acquire information. Okay, it seems a bit complicated to implement. And the other, you know, the other direction would be to remove a constraint and say to put the responsibility really in the hands of the user. So okay, you, you, you know, maybe there's some insurance, some mechanisms, some incentives, so, so that there is no force constraint. Uh, and so when there is no constraint, everything is, is smooth, the value information is guaranteed to be, to be positive, not negative. With this, you know, I conclude my presentation. Thank you.